Hello everybody, we're going to now start the meeting. We have 95, I was hoping we'd get to 100. Oh, we're almost there, 96 participants. Beyond giving you the numbers of attendees, my name is Mark Lippman, I'm the director of UCLTB, and it's a, a great pleasure to welcome you to the, this meeting. I'd just like to introduce my co-chair, Dima Katze. Hi, uh, good morning, and uh, thank you very much for joining. Indeed, we've hit that uh, magic number. Oh, we now 101 uh, participants on the call. Uh, thank you for the, taking the time to join. And I'm Dimaka Solibina from Africa Health Research Institute. I'm the uh, clinical trials unit lead, uh, as well as a faculty member at ARI. And uh, as you know, this is a joint, uh, a joint or collaborative engagement between both ARI and UCL, and we hope you'll enjoy your time with us. We look forward to your participation. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Dimakatsu. And, uh, and as she says, this is uh, uh, what we believe is a really important meeting that we wanted to uh, develop over the last few months really on the basis of we know just how effective Vodacrylin is and we know that since 2012 it really has changed the, the management of multidrug resistant tuberculosis. Yet at the same time we can see uh, ominous warnings of potentially really quite major impacts on drug resistance whereas for example most of the time people will usually think of something like Vodacrylin as maybe two percent background uh, resistance. There are disturbing reports, as we'll see uh, through the session, of resistance 10, 20, and even 30 percent in people who've had previous treatment uh, for uh, multidrug resistant tuberculosis. So that's why we really felt that this session and this meeting was so important. It's fantastic to have the range uh, and diversity of speakers that have agreed to take part. And um, when I've stopped finishing, Dimakatsu uh, stopped. Dimakatsu is going to take us through the structure of the uh, of the um, uh, symposium, um, as we want to try and get quite a lot out of it. As you know, it is being recorded, um, and we do really want to try and get your uh, your input. Uh, Dimakatsu will explain how it's all going to work, and so I'm going to hand over to Dimakatsu now. Okay. Uh, thanks, Mark. Um, yeah, this is really a very packed uh, program. Uh, we have a wonderful agenda lined up uh, and you have to stay tuned uh, not to miss out on all the uh, various segments that have been prepared. Uh, we'll first start off with the, a few uh, short presentations uh, that have been uh, selected uh, to represent uh, various concerns uh, or, or areas of uh, interest uh, with regard to bedaquiline prescribing. Um, and the first uh, one will be uh, a perspective from TB survivors. Uh, then we'll have a presentation uh, on clinical practice concerns uh, and then a general overview on bedaquiline resistance. And then uh, number four will be future directions or research or clinical trials uh, related to bedaquiline, and then a policy uh, sort of discussion in terms of these uh, uh, concerns that we have on uh, how to be responsible users. So those are the um, five presentations, and I think we'll have one uh, just one after the other. And then, uh, then we have three segments uh, following that of panel discussions. Uh, the first uh, will be on bedaquiline, what went well and what went wrong. Uh, is history repeating itself? Uh, and we'll have uh, various uh, panelist members sharing their opinion. And as uh, a guest, uh, you're also most welcome to put your comments or questions uh, in the chat box and those will be addressed either uh, by the panel members during the discussions uh, or at the end. So we have about 30 minutes for each of these uh, panel discussions. We have 20 minutes where the panelists are talking among themselves. And then at the end, we'll have a question and answer uh, session, uh, possibly followed by a conclusion or remarks before we move on to the next session. Uh, then the second session on this panel discussions will be on bedaquiline, what needs to happen right now? Uh, what do we need to change uh, to make sure that we are responsible prescribers, uh, responsible physicians and policymakers with the little tools that we have? Um, 
And uh, then the last segment will be where to next. Now that we've discussed, we've heard what are the concerns, what are the differences uh, between the countries, what are the potential pitfalls, uh, what do we need to do uh, to prevent uh, something that we could see is possibly coming, or is there really no reason to worry? Uh, but I think we need to find a way of how do we uh, reduce the potential risk uh, for this wonder drug uh, that we've had in the last few years and what ethical considerations uh, should we be thinking about if we were to change things. And then, we'll, of course, at the end, we'll have some closing remarks uh, to just uh, wrap up uh, the whole event. So as I said, it's quite uh, a packed uh, agenda. Uh, but I think the whole idea is that to have uh, different perspectives, to have a, an international flavor, and most importantly, to also get your participation. So thank you for joining, and we'll go straight ahead into the uh, short presentations. And uh, the first presenter will be a perspective uh, from uh, uh, TB Survivor, which will be done by uh, Oksana, who is an executive director and of Society of Moldova Against uh, Tuberculosis Association. Uh, so thank you and over to you, Oksana. Thank you so much, dear audience. I'm very pleased to be here and to share my own uh, personal experience as well as the experience that we are doing in the country as a TB activist and TB, TB civil society organization working and engaged in uh, TB for mostly more than one decade. Uh, so my name is Oksana. I am the executive director of civil society organization Society of Moldova Against Tuberculosis in Moldova. This is a patient-led organization formed in 2010, and I'm really, really glad to share what I think about the TB and what I really want to share about Bidakalin in our today's discussion. Uh, my TB story started in 2007 I was when I was diagnosed first with TB, and I followed the treatment for drug-susceptible TB, while a couple of months later, I, I was actually informed by the doctors that I am a drug-resistant TB. Uh, uh, but since the medicines were not available at that uh, at that moment in the country, the only option what I was going to do is to follow the the existing treatment, and I and I did so. I was uh, following the the, um, the treatment for dra drug susceptible TB, including injectables. But a couple of months later, I said no no to injectables because uh, two months. Within two months, I developed very uh, serious side effects. Among the, those are uh, heavy vestibular disorders, walking difficulties, uh, walking unsteadily, weaknesses uh, of the legs, sudden falls, eye disorders. It was very difficult for me to concentrate my vision, and I had a very difficult uh, inability to focus the, the pictures uh, in my head. Therefore, I followed additional treatment, which was very expensive at that time. And it took me months to learn back, work and focus my vision again. In 2000, but as there were no very big positive dynamic in my treatment, when the MDRTB treatment became available in Moldova, it was 2011, eight, I started the treatment with the second line TB drugs. And again, I said two weeks, uh, after two weeks of treatment with injectables, I said no, because the similar uh, similar side effects were coming again, and we, um, thanks to the doctor, it was possible to interrupt the treat to interrupt the injectable and follow the treatment only with pills. Still, what I was said at that moment is that I I'm taking a very serious decision, and that was on my own risk. So I refused the injectables and followed twenty uh, uh, four months of treatment only with pills, saying that I risk it because I reject the injectables, but. Thank, thanks to God and thanks to, to the doctors around me, uh, the, the, my treatment was really successful and I finished and I'm done with TB almost for more than 10, 10 years now. What we do as an organization is, of course, as being a TB survivor, we use and uh, promote personal TB experience as a key motivational approach when working, when, uh, and, uh, working approaching uh, people in treatment, peer approach and connecting people to services. We focus very much on cooperation and a new word that we are using now is coordination, which, which sometimes means more than cooperation and other things uh, because it's needed 
uh, between research academia, between primary health care, between TB services and local public authorities or local public governments, as we say, in our country. One of the focus is to respect human rights and, and to understand that we need to, 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 to modelize the treatment based on a people-centered care, and this is the key approach in our, in our activities. We advocate and engage in decision-making and policy-making in the country. On the right hand, you can see just some figures of our last activities, which are based on our service delivery. We had more than 25 people diagnosed and initiated with our support with TB in the country. Uh, more than 200 people benefited from the support and the TB services in the TB clinics, TB hospitals, we really appreciate a lot while working since uh, since our foundation. Among the service provision work, we do a lot of based on advocacy. We, we do trainings, we do uh, workshops, we organize uh, conferences. Uh, again, we focus on TB human rights. We uh, engaged at regional levels, uh, we uh, interact a lot with the TB Europe coalition in the region. I am as well, I forgot to say, I'm a TB Global Cab member, which is a very good experience for us to share and, and see what is done globally in the in the domain of uh, of TB. Additionally, we did some publication. For example, just last year we did a CRG and stigma assessment, which is available on our site. Uh, we did the we developed the community engagement in research and develop glossary of terms and we did a report on social intervention interventions in the management of uh, children which is really important in our country to promote uh, disinstitutionalization of children and uh, uh, treatment in the ambulatory uh, in the ambulatory uh, area if to speak about the decalin, the first time when I heard about the decalin, it was in 2009 when the, the name even is not, was the decalin for the, for the product. When it was studied in phase two clinical trials in patients with uh, MDR-TB. Since 2011 and 2016, it's, it's almost seven years that we did advocacy at national level to introduce uh, the decalin. And as you see on the right hand, we had a special ministerial disposition and a guidance developed for the introduction of the new TB drugs, uh, mainly based for the decalin, which later was used for other, other new drugs. From 2019 and 2021, we advocated for the revision of the National Essential Medicine List after the fact when the WHO revised the grouping of TB drugs, uh, making the bedaclin the standard of care for drug-resistant TB. And uh, so in October 2021, we managed to have this important uh, document revised at country level and now we have a national essential medicine list in Moldova in accordance with the WHO classification for the TB drugs. Uh, in 2021 and 2023 we started the company to, to do a strong advocacy to revise the procurement uh, mechanism for, for the drugs which is another kind of issue on procuring the, the decalin. Right now uh, since May, there is a technical working group at the level of a parliamentary commission in Moldova, which is uh, dealing and focusing on three important uh, areas in in, um, in the country. About the decline opportunities and risks in the Republic of Moldova, we, we uh, remarked, uh, per general, a good uh, decrease of TB incidents in the last year. In the last years, uh, we have. Right now, all eligible people prescribed with the decalin as a standard of care. TB treatment is fully provided by the government who have centralized acquisition, have drug management and supply. A DST for the decalin along with the Lenezolid is available in the country since February 2019. We have additionally clofazamine and delamanid the DST available since October 2021. Uh, as well, we have a strong commitment, which is absolutely crucial in, in our country, uh, from the National TB program, and we have a good support from the Global Fund to, to make the decalin available uh, country countrywide in, in Moldova. Uh, as an as an opportunity to to revise the situation is the uh, is the patent opposition, which was uh, initiated by. Uh, 
inițiativa pozitivă aici, a civil society organization, a partner organization here, who initiated a patent opposition against the Bacillin on behalf of TB and civil society community in Moldova. Uh, what a risk that uh, there are cases of resistance, yet they are to be confirmed in Moldova. Um, regarding the accessibility of the Bacillin, we understand when the, the incidence is decreasing, it of course will, will ask for small quantities, and small quantities uh, uh, will eventually lead to high prices at the, at the local level of the market. Uh, national procurement mechanism is rigid. Uh, the, the only one acquisition from the national uh, resources was done in 2020, and we see the different uh, the, the prices is extremely different. It's uh, four times higher when we are using the national procurement mechanism for buying the uh, when we are comparing with the global drug facility prices, global, global drug facility um, mechanism. So absolutely crucial differences. Uh, we as a country really heavy, ha have a heavy dependence when we're speaking about new drugs, and the, including the Dacolene. And what, what is true, and this is the fact, the Dacolene uh, has, the, has extended the, this patent until uh, 2027. Uh, as a as a way forward, I, I do think and I strongly believe that the Dacolene is life-saving medicine and it was also already confirmed by WHO classifying the Dacolene as the standard of care for drug resistant TB. And I'm sure that the ensuring availability and universal access of essential TB medicines is the governmental responsibility and we need to work a lot with, with our governments with national TB programs to be able with civil society to make it understandable and clear for every actor. Uh, what is important is, of course, careful and responsible monitoring and interrupt supply of medicines, because this is ex absolutely critical when we are speaking about preventing resistance. We cannot, we cannot have it if we have interrupted supply, if we don't have monitoring. Volumes of medicines are extremely relevant for Moldova because the, the Incidence is decreasing, the prices will go high, and for a country of Moldova, it's, 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 an, it's an issue. Uh, domestic finance procurement mechanism should be fortified in Moldova to, in order to access the medicines at best uh, available prices. And of course, if we are speaking about patents, patent legislation needs revision in the country and inclusion of treats flexibilities. But as well, at the if we are speaking about global global level, it is understandable that we need clear differentiation set between life-saving medicines and other goods when applying intellectual property rights. So thank you so much for the attention. That was my presentation. I'm looking forward for the discussion. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you. According to the agenda, we move over to the next presentation. Uh, just as a reminder to all the presenters that, that the TB survivors section had 10 minutes, but the rest will be five minutes. Thank you. And we'll try and uh, give you a thumbs up or one finger or four to, to just let you know how much time is left. Um, our next speaker is... Uh, Shall, shall I jump in? It's uh, Pumese Tisele, uh, Advocacy Officer for TB Proof South Africa. Okay, so as I said, it's a very short presentation and I wanted to turn off the video because uh, my connection is not stable. So I'm not sure if that will work. Okay. So I am Pumese Tisele, I am actually an ex TB survivor. I am based in Cape Town, South Africa, and I work for TB Proof as an advocacy office and also a research assistant. So what happened was, was that in the year was 2010, and at this time I was the first year student at university, I saw that I was not well, and so I went to the doctor as we usually do, and the doctor, the private doctor, checked for all common diseases, and then they all came back negative. But because I was so sick, they could not figure out as to what was wrong with me, I was then uh, told that I need to test for TB at a, at a public clinic because they did not test for TB at the private sector. So I went to the private sector, the public clinic, very, very sick at this point. 
And then I told them that I got a federal letter to actually test for TB. So at the time I had to cover up this period time and actually wait for three weeks to get the results. I did that and I waited for three weeks and I went back to the clinic and then the results, they came back and then it said that I was negative, I didn't have TB. So again, the doctors were so confused because they could see physically I was not well. And then they told me that uh, I need to go to another clinic to get a chicks X-ray. And then at this point I was tested through an X-ray and then I remember this one doctor saying that this is very bad because apparently the X-ray was not as it's supposed to be, it had holes on it. So I started on the first line TB drugs. I called normal TB. I took the drugs and I was not getting better. I was actually getting worse. So I had to go back to the clinic again and then they saw me and then I had to test, I had to wait again for three weeks. And then I was called to come. Actually, this time around, they told me I had MDRT. I had no idea what they were talking about. I did not know what is MDRT at the time. So they told me that I will need to take treatment every day for two years. And also I'll get an injection called cannabis injection every day for six months. So uh, I took these tablets and uh, I woke up. I mean, the pictures would have been great now, the slides to actually demonstrate everything. But I, I, I took the tablets. I was actually now being uh, referred to staying at the hospital called Brooklyn Church Hospital. And I, I four months, or no, I was getting better. I woke up and I could not hear anything, meaning I was deaf. So the nurse tried to explain everything in speaking, but I could not make up what she was saying. So then she had to take a paper and a pen to write everything down for me. So the nurse has to go down and, and write everything for me. Uh, in writing, told me that I, not, I need to go to the audio department uh, to get a uh, tested hearing test. And then the audio English wrote down on the folder that I was deaf. Then I need to go to the doctor at my work to explain what was going on. So the doctor now, the conversations changed. So I was the one doing the speaking, which was very awkward for me because I could not even hear myself. And the doctor had to do all the writing. And then they explained very clear that uh, they are sorry that there's nothing they can do, that the hearing loss is uh, irreversible, meaning I'm permanently deaf. And that again, they emphasize on the sorry. And then they tried to explain that the deafness is called actually by the cannabis injection that you see on this picture. So at that point, uh, my, 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 my choice was either I was deaf or dead. So it already happened. So I didn't have much choice actually to choose what I would do with my life. So I only find out also another doctor in South Africa actually got a compassionate use of the beta qualin so that they could save the hearing. So she was lucky enough to get that uh, through the private sector and she was able to get access to the beta qualin and also save her hearing and also her career. But I was, I was unfortunately now at this point because it happened suddenly, I didn't have like prior side effects to actually notice that I'm losing my hearing and anything like that. I woke up and my hearing was deaf. Next, next slide, slide please. So as I was deaf uh, at, at Brooklyn Chest, I, I was told no no MDR, I was pre-XDR. Pre-XDR what they checked and then they saw that there's something growing in my in my lungs, liquid. I was respired to Crotosphere. Uh, doctors of Crotosphere said it might be cancer, it might be tumor. tumor. But luckily, it was never one of those. It was just some liquid that was building up, and I was discharged back to go to the branches to continue my pre external medication. Eventually, I was discharged. And then, while I was at the clinic, I was called again to be told that I actually had XDR TB, and that the chance is that I was actually wrongly diagnosed or late diagnosed to the point that I lost my hearing, and to the point that now even the pre external TB drugs are not working. Just know that the drugs are the same, just that they add more if you are resistant to, to one or two of the drugs. So, uh, yes, so I was told that I had 20% chance of surviving because I had XDR TB, and that is a drug at the time, not very point, but another drug that was uh, used uh, by MSF. I was able to get uh, access to that drug, and I was actually cured from XDR TB after three years and eight months. So, remember, as I was permanently deaf, so I wanted to go back to school, University of Cape Town, consumer studies, but I could not because I did not hear. So through crowdfunding and, and, and you know, some funds that I had, I was able to get a cochlear implants. I literally have two of those now I can hear using cochlear implants, as you can see from the surgery there, and that's how it looks from the outside. And I was able to continue my studies at the university and uh, have my social science degree. And it didn't end it because I was like, it was at the right time where MSF worked, I was at the right place and I had support to be able to fully continue my studies, but I saw that there was a need for, for, for policy change, for continuance to change and all of that. 
So please, next slide, please. So uh, as I said, I was lucky enough uh, to get cochlear implants, but not like enough to try and prevent, like to get a better quality at the time. So uh, with my, for instance, with the current wing days, wing that uh, myself and Nandita from India, from India. So what happened was uh, Johnson and Johnson, you know, the pharma company, they wanted to extend their patent, like for instance, continue using the, the, the current uh, beta pollen treatment that they're using. You know, that means that they were preventing like the generic version of the treatment, meaning that people actually needed the drug, could not have access to it because of the price and other factors. So myself and this inheritance also deaf from India also like enough to get cochlear implants through um through also crowdfunding and we had to fight. No, we only you know we already got deaf, so we had to, to prevent the next person to actually experience hearing loss. And then we knew that this drug can actually replace the injection injectable that was given. So we filed that patent with uh with the Indian uh, courts and actually this year it was approved in 2019. But they say it was approved that yes, they stopping the change in uh chosen and chosen monopoly on this life-saving drug, and that people now will have access to the generic version of, of beta calling. So it's it didn't happen suddenly. We as I said, it happened started in 2019. We had to do campaigns as to why we need this drug. This drug can prevent hearing loss, this drug can prevent suffering, this drug can actually help the patients to actually be on treatment because as I said, I was on treatment for at least three years and eight months. And this drug can actually have less side effects compared to being permanently deaf. So there was a campaigns also, I was part of those campaigns like patients before patents, as you can see, that we need better quality for all so that people can have access to this life saving drug at an easier price and uh, at, at less times so that we can be able to continue with their lives, can be able to go back to school, can be able to the TV survivors and TV champions who are trying to speak up and not be afraid of big pharma and any other companies out there that do drugs. So yes, last slide, please. So yes, thank you for listening. So as I as I said, I'm an activist and also an advocate of his TV Pro. So this is from actually from Cape Town. When you want something to happen in the in a South African context, you actually take it to the Department of Trade and Industry for instance to actually change the patent laws. So that we, it, it never made sense to me that there are drugs out there, but they are not easily available to those people who try it in the most. So we, we, we as TV survivors, we actually have the voice to, 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 for policy change. We actually have the voice to change whatever we see is wrong when it comes to TV. And that we use our personal stories to influence change, be it in a part of the national, for instance, in a sort of contest, uh, national Department of Health, in, in talks with the government, we want things to happen quickly and, and as, as efficiently as possible that we can prevent the suffering and the loss that people with TV actually uh, experience in their lifetime. So yes, thank you for listening. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Pumeza. Uh, thank you very much for sharing your story. It's really always humbling and uh, to hear uh, the TB survivors' uh, perspective. Uh, we thank you for your participation. I uh, will move along. Uh, our next speaker is uh, uh, Professor Linto uh, from um, Medical Research in Mumbai, India. As we said, we we'll have a very international uh, perspective uh, in this discussion. We're moving from South Africa to India and um, probably back in South Africa. And uh, over to you. Please remember you have five minutes and uh, hopefully you can stay within the time limit. Thanks. Thank you. I'd like to thank the Africa Health Institute, uh, the Research Institute and UCL for inviting me to this talk and for organizing this very important conversation uh, around Bedekulin. I practice at the tertiary care private institute uh, in the city of Mumbai, and I will just go through what the background status of uh, TB in India, healthcare, and uh, specifically around Bedekulin. So healthcare in India, around 70% of the population pays for healthcare out of pocket. So it's uh, it's heavily leans towards the private sector when it comes to, uh, to health in general. There are formally qualified uh, providers or the allopaths or the Western medicine practitioners. But in addition to that, you also have less than fully qualified practitioners who practice alternate systems of medicine, including informal healthcare providers. And what is also unique is that very often chemists or pharmacies dispense medications over the counter uh, very often without a doctor being uh, in, in the loop. In addition to this, close to half of all patients uh, with TB access care in the private sector. So, you know, we know from multiple studies now 
that when it comes to tuberculosis, the first point of contact very often is the private sector. So let's look at what the quality of healthcare in the private sector is. It's a very important question for us considering how many people access care here. This was a study published in 1991 uh, by Mukundu Plekar, who went on to work with the WHO, who found that when 100 practitioners in the city, uh, in, in an urban settlement in the city, were asked to write a standardized prescription for tuberculosis, we had 80 different prescriptions uh, that were prescribed. We repeated the study in 2010, and we found that not much had changed. We asked 106 practitioners to provide uh, a standardized prescription for tuberculosis, and we found 63 different pres prescriptions, out of which we thought only about six were, uh, were in line with the guidelines. Again, suggesting that the private health sector in India is highly unregulated uh, and often not very science-based. We, there was a simulated study which was done in 2013, which also found that pharmacies, just medical shops across the country, uh, found 67% dispensing antimicrobials without a prescription. So the widespread antimicrobial resistance that we come across the country comes as no surprise to a lot of us, simply because there is a indiscriminate use uh, of antibiotics very often prescribed over counters. We do think that this irrational prescription contributed to the MDR epidemic in India. In 2009, for the first time in the city of Mumbai, uh, Dr. Misri uh, reported a prevalence of about 24% among previously untreated patients with, uh, with TB had MDR-TB, and 41% among those who failed treatment for TB had MDR-TB. And this, this, this was a community-based study and we found a quarter of all patients in the city of Mumbai had MDR-TB to begin with. And, and this, was, this was very shocking at the time. We also found, and multiple studies again have reported a very high rate of fluoroquinolone resistance in our country. 66% was what we found when we looked at our samples. Dr. Jay uh, and I looked at uh, the different samples submitted to our hospital, and we found that 66% of MDR patients uh, also had fluoroquinolone resistance. And a recent genome-wide uh, uh, study found that there was a resistance rate of about 73.6 percent fluoroquinolone resistance among fluoroquinolone resistance among those with MDR TB. Again, these are these are probably the highest rates reported across the world, and we do cons we do think that indiscriminate prescription of uh, treatment has very often contributed to this. So when it comes to MDR TB, we know we've already Fumeza has already spoken to us about the irreversible hearing loss, the the, the kidney damage that we very often see uh, with injectables, and the burden of daily injectables. There's a quality of life which is seriously hampered by the fact that you have to take an injectable medication every day, and there are financial losses associated with loss of work when you have to turn up at a at a particular dispensary to receive your daily injectable. So Bedequilin came as a welcome relief to a country like ours. Uh, initially was uh, offered on a compassionate use program in the private sector. There was a lot of paperwork involved uh, through the company and it was provided to a very few select patients. In 2016, the Ministry of Health and Family Welfare made it available through a conditional access program to different states across the country. There has been a gradual increase in access since. In 2017, we believe that only 2.2% of eligible patients were receiving the drug. We believe that the figure is a lot more than that currently. At my hospital, which is a private care tertiary institute, we have a private public collaboration and we get we, we have access to the drug through the public sector, despite the patients presenting to us in the private sector. Uh, we've treated close to 250 patients over the past three or four years. Uh, again, that is a small number. Uh, but again, this is a limited experience at a tertiary care center. Well, what's exciting is that the drug has gone off patent this year, again, through the efforts of Fumeza and Nandita Venkatesan, which she just spoke to us about. Uh, the, the efforts of the company at evergreening the drug have been turned down as a result of which we expect the drug to be a fraction of its cost of what it used to be in the past. Again, um, this is a very positive step for patients with drug-resistant TB across the country. However, this is the note of caution. Uh, when I spoke to uh, the MSF outreach project in Mumbai, uh, they work uh, in an urban settlement in Mumbai. They told me that among drug-resistant TB patients who failed treatment and were exposed to bedequilin, about 23% of them were found to be resistant on phenotypic DST. Again, this is a select population, but again, close to a quarter of these individuals had developed bedequilin resistance, suggesting that we can anticipate this to be the picture in the future uh, uh, if the drug is used indiscriminately. 
our own lab, when I spoke to our uh, head of microbiology, uh, of the 592 samples that were tested last in, in 2021, 27 were resistant for beraculin, which is about 4.6%. That number has increased to 11% in 2022. Again, this is a very enriched population. Most of these patients do come, uh, are, are sent to us. Most of these samples are sent to us when patients are very often failing. So this does not necessarily mean that these are reflective of the community at large. But again, it is a warning signal for us that we need to be cautious about the use of the drug. So what's next? So these are the two arguments which we have. In India, waiting for the drug bedequilin is a matter of life and death for TB patients. So we do know that this is a game changer. We do know that uh, this a regimen that contains bedequilin is far superior for multiple reasons than those containing injectables. At the same time, there is this there is this counter argument which was presented in an editorial which said that should the country act in a hurry? And while I don't believe that this is a valid argument at all, I, I don't believe that we should be protecting a drug for the future while we let patients suffer presently. Uh, I do think that we need to be cautious about how we use this drug lest we use lose it in the future. So the key challenges summarizing would be universal access. We would want all our patients with drug resistant TB to have access to the drug, but at the same time, we would want checks in place so that it doesn't go down the road of antimicrobial resistance that we see for, for other drugs across the country. We would want a universal DST to be accessible across the country so that the drug again can be used in a judicious and responsible manner. All of us, Need to be need to wake up to the fact that betaquilin is another drug which eventually will have a significant amount of patients displaying resistance to. So we need to start thinking about future drugs uh, and how how we can protect our patients in the future. And of course, we know that there is a shortening of of regimens to two months. There's a recent study which showed that regimens for standard susceptible TB can be shortened for two months with drugs such as betaquilin. So, but, but we need to be cautious about rolling it out uh, so that we don't lose this drug for drug resistant TB. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Lance, for that very comprehensive review. And again, introducing the idea of drug resistance. So I'd now like to invite Professor Grant Theron, uh, who, as you know, is a professor of molecular biology and human genetics at the University of Stellenbosch uh, to bring us up to speed on where things are at with resistance, Grant. Uh, so, so thanks uh, very much for the opportunity to speak here today. Um, I'm going to be uh, talking on behalf of a large group of people at Stellenbosch University, but really just focusing on our local experience uh, with the Daquilin uh, resistance gain um, in one of the first settings where it was prioritized uh, for use. And I'm going to talk about uh, two studies. So the first study, uh, which was really led by Brigitte on the right, uh, looked at people across 12 facilities um, from January 2016 towards the end of 2017 um, who received pedaquiline based on compassionate grounds. Uh, so this is prior to pedaquiline becoming in South Africa uh, the standard of care for rifampicin resistant TB. Um, and this work is available as a preprint at the link below. So we had 129 individuals and from those 129 individuals, we identified 31% uh, or 40 people who were persistently culture positive, meaning that they had confirmed culture positivity at baseline before bedaquiline initiation, and they remained culture positive after a minimum of four months of their bedaquiline based regimen. So these 31% uh, or 40 individuals uh, had um, their genotypic and their phenotypic results compared at baseline and at follow-up. And what we found is as follows. So we first grouped patients as having no evidence of baseline resistance using phenotypic or genotypic methods and no evidence of follow-up resistance. And 45% of patients, uh, despite not bacteriologically responding to treatment, uh, were susceptible using these methods. Um, the other category we used was that we compared people who had no evidence of baseline resistance, who were presumably susceptible, and their follow-up results. And we found that 47% of these people who had prolonged culture positivity had evidence of resistance gain. So they were susceptible uh, at baseline and they were resistant at follow-up by one of these methods. Uh, interestingly, we also found 8% of people who were resistant both at baseline and follow-up. 
um, despite uh, epidacrylene being used uh, for the first time in this population. So quite an alarming rate of epidacrylene resistance gain. Again, these are pre-selected people who have very complex treatment histories and who have prolonged culture positivity, but approximately half of them had evidence of resistance gain. Um, we looked at some factors associated with increasing the likelihood of uh, resistance gain. And it's important to first of all note that patients in this population group are on a lot of uh, TB drugs, right? So um, on average, patients were on approximately eight drugs. And when you look at the proportion of those drugs that were likely effective, they are really not on many effective drugs. And indeed, in patients who acquired resistance, they had on average fewer effective drugs as opposed to the people who remain susceptible um, after four months of bedaquiline treatment. And these are some of the odds ratios associated with res resistance gain. Uh, and you can see them listed there, the number of affected drugs. Importantly, fluoroquinolone resistance seems to be, be very important for enabling the later resistance of bedaquiline. Uh, yeah, the later emergence of adaquinine resistance, as well as uh, there was a linkage between clofazamine use uh, or prior exposure. Um, this is a very busy figure, but it really uh, wants to illustrate the point that adaquinine strains do, adaquinine resistance strains are very capable of transmission. If you look at these uh, figures that I've circled, these are patients who, if you look at the number in the red pill, have a very large uh, SNP distance between their baseline and their follow-up isolate, suggesting they have a new strain. And when you look at these people who have the red circle, not only was there a large SNP difference suggesting reinfection between baseline and follow-up, but as you can see, the color of the pill changes from white to red, which means that those people became bedaquiline resistance. So at admission to the facility, they were bedaquiline susceptible. After four months, they were bedaquiline resistant, and this appeared to be due to a different strain. I want to give one illustrative example of variant diversity. Um, this is an individual who died after 168 days of bedaquiline treatment. They acquired resistance. At baseline, uh, they obviously had no phenotypic evidence of resistance, and both a targeted deep sequencing and whole genome sequencing indicated wild-type susceptible variants in the, in the, the genome. However, at um, follow-up, uh, a variant had emerged, and this was only detected, this variant was detected by WGS and targeted deep sequencing. But importantly, deep sequencing revealed a whole uh, complexity of minority populations um, that accompanied that uh, dominant variant uh, at follow-up. And this is really illustrated further in this wonderful case report uh, by Rob Warren's group, which shows that in this uh, individual, there are constant dynamic shifting uh, populations of mycobacterium tuberculosis, specifically in pedacoline associated uh, resistance variants, as well as compensatory mutations. And this paper also showed that these populations change after the drug is stopped. And this patient actually had pedacoline uh, phenotypic resistance emerge after they had stopped treatment for pedacoline. Um, and importantly, uh, genotypic DST was able to uh, detect resistance earlier than phenotypic DST. So in summary, I, I think this shows that compassionate priority use uh, and access to pedacoline, it will always be accompanied by the emergence of resistance. That seems inevitable. Um, but this is no doubt worsened without having routine programmatic pedacoline DST available, which was unavailable at the time of that study. Uh, Bedaquiline resistant strains do transmit. We've shown that uh, with the nosocomial transmission. There are important technical points. Uh, the effect of treatment disruption needs to be considered. The relevance of sub resistant uh, MIC increases um, to strains exposed to bedaquiline is not well understood. And there is still a large amount of discordance between phenotypic and genotypic readouts. It seems that protecting the fluoroquinolone seems key. And this is especially important because fluoroquinolone resistance is not insignificant in people who currently get bedaquinine in South Africa, who just have a fampicin resistant TB. I think um, from a global perspective, many national programs, especially countries like South Africa, who have been using bedaquinine now for um, almost eight or nine years, have incredibly rich data sets. Um, but it's very hard to get access to these as a common or a public good. 
and we need to think about how we make that an accessible global repository. We need real-time surveillance um, using genotypic DST if they are potentially less sincere from COVID. And one thing that I think is especially important is to think about should we make the ability to do DST a regulatory requirement before countries consider rolling out a new drug. Um, it's typically considered a diagnostic thing, not a drug thing. But I personally do not think a compound should be used if uh, there is not a framework for guaranteeing that DST is done. And importantly, this needs to be done in a way where we do not further disincentivize drug companies who already have a very complex relationship with TB drugs. That's it from me. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Grant. Uh, thanks for your thoughts. Um, looks like we're going to have a challenge, Mark. Uh, people are not sticking to five minutes. <laughs> um, it's not just you. Uh, so we are uh, running behind time, but hopefully we'll be able uh, to catch up. Our next speaker will be Dr. Francesca Conradi, who is a researcher based at VETS and I think manages multiple clinical trials within South Africa in both KZN and Eastern Cape. And we hope uh, to hear from you, your thoughts on what should we be doing on clinical trials aspect. Thank you. And you have five minutes, uh, Dr. Conradi. <laughs> Okay, yeah, off I go, and I think I will be able to recruit the time. As mentioned before, I've been involved in clinical trials, particularly for drug-resistant TB, and I was involved in the original registrational trials of bedaquiline in South Africa. Uh, from very early on, I could see that this drug was a game-changer. We did a blinded trial, and when we were unblinded, we knew which patients were given which medicines by their response to treatment. And PSS was about two years after the trial ended. So the only picture that I'm going to show is, um, oh, my slides are stuck. Oh, there we go. Is to just remind ourselves what the impact on mortality. So this is data from our national program. And it was taken about uh, two years into the national rollout of bedaquinine as a drug. And what we looked at is in the EDR, which is available, our national database for drug-resisting TB, we looked at a comparison between those who were given bedaquinine and those who weren't. Um, we looked at both MDR and then using the old definition of XDR, which was resistant to injectables and quinolones. And you could see very early on the curve separated out and bedaquiline conferred a mortality benefit. So aside from the side effects, and bedaquiline is an incredibly safe drug, aside from the side effects, if you acquire drug-resistant TB and you were given bedaquiline, you were more likely to survive. So I think this is the thing that we've got to bear in mind, that it saves people's lives. So what are we going to do about this? In terms of the national program in South Africa, bedaquiline phenotypic resistance is conducted on most patients who have fluoroquinolone resistant TB. And at the moment, the figure of bedaquiline resistance in, uh, so across the program, not looking at prior exposure, but only to their resistance to resistance to fluoroquinolone is about 2%, and that goes through all programs. And I think that what that's telling us is that when we're looking at a less selected population, in a country that's prescribed between 40 to 50,000 units courses of bedaquiline, the resistance rate is around 2%. So what can we do to prevent this 2% growing? In order to um, uh, prevent the development of resistance, I don't think that there's anyone who disagrees in this forum that if we prescribe medicines, the patients have to be uh, adherent to that therapy. So we need to develop much better support to adherence to therapy, which includes things like dealing with substance abuse, dealing with interrupted clinic services, um, dealing with the, the chaos that occurs, I'm sure, in everyone's lives uh, if they are put onto treatment for six months or even longer. We need to treat TB for as short as possible. And the recent endorsement of the WHO of the BPALM regimen is a great step forward because the shorter, the better, provided we are getting success rates of above 90%. The next thing is we have to be looking at finding resistance. And at the moment, the truth is in big TB programs, phenotypic 
uh, detection of resistance is the only detection we have. It does take a while for us to get that result back because phenotypic resistance requires culture. Uh, but we need to be stressing that we are looking for patients with the new definition of XDR who are resistant to both fluoroquinolone and bedaquiline. I'm not sure exactly how one goes about treating that, and I think it goes back to the old uh, kitchen sink approach that we use any uh, uh, medicines that will work. Then in terms of therapeutic strategies, what can we do today uh, to try and improve this? For some reason, when we use antimicrobials, we tend to go for the minimal dose. And we've seen the havoc that that has, re uh, has caused when we used uh, rifampicin in the lowest possible dose. We would all be out of jobs if we hadn't done that. Slight joke, maybe incorrect. But we need to make sure that we go for the highest possible dose. There has been some work that overcoming phenotypic resistance may be achieved by increasing the dose of bedaquiline. And that's one of the things we need to be looking at in trials is can we increase the dose, of course, without the concomitant increase in uh, severe adverse events. At the moment, the way that bedaquiline is prescribed is a little bit strange. We give 400 milligrams for two weeks and then 200 milligrams Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. And in some recent trials, they've looked at different strategies of dosing, which might make adherence easier. It certainly has the same uh, outcomes of using a daily dose. Um, the problem is that once stuff gets written into a TB program, it's very difficult to remove it. But maybe looking at different, different strategies. As we know, the EBA of bedaquiline is not impressive, so the early bactericidal activity is not impressive. However, it is a really good drug in the long term. But what if we just thought about protecting bedaquiline for the first two weeks? And I know that we don't like injectables, but what if we used a strategy of using two or four doses of amikacin in the first two weeks? These are experimental ideas and by no way endorsed by any TB program or even myself at this stage. But these are things that we could do with the tools that we have in our hands. INH is a very useful TB drug and about 30% of TB that's rifampicin resistant is only rifampicin resistant in South Africa and we still active, have activity of INH. So what if we protected, uh, the, protected bedaquiline in those early two weeks with high dose INH? Again, these are not strategies that I'm uh, saying should be done, but things that we need to explore with the tools that we currently have. In TB at the moment, and I'm not going to go ahead and present a long, complicated pipeline uh, drug uh, that we have, drugs that we have in the pipeline, but we have more drugs in the TB pipeline than we've had in my entire career. So there are follow-on drugs that we uh, will be able to introduce into our TB programs. And in addition to that, there are new ways of thinking about clinical trials that will get these drugs into our programs in a shorter way. So there is hope if uh, as bedaquiline resistance increases, and it will increase, I don't think that there is a single infectious disease when we introduce an antimicrobial that uh, resistance doesn't develop. But we do have a backup in terms of other drugs in the pipeline that will uh, hopefully be able to overcome this. Thank you very much. Um, I hope I made five minutes. Thank you so much, Francesca. And now I call on our last speaker, uh, Vu Tech Xuan, uh, who is an assistant professor at the uh, National University of Singapore uh, in biomedical ethics, uh, to pick up on some of the, the themes uh, that have been developing uh, for the last speakers. We will then move into the session uh, where we start to think about what's gone uh, well and what's gone wrong. A lot of it has already been covered by the speakers. Thank you. Tech Xuan. So um, I think one of the key questions that's driving the discussion is how we should address the threat of drug resistance uh, TB and protect the global health good of efficacious TB medications like bedaquiline. And I will be um, looking at this question primarily from an ethical perspective. 
and I'll be drawing a lot from the WHO guidance uh, for the implementation of the NTB strategy, which was published in 2017. So one of the key issue with TB control and treatment is really the risk of uh, poor adherence to treatment, which uh, presents risk to the patient in terms of treatment failure and disease relapse, as well as risk to the community in terms of transmission of tuberculosis, as well as the increase or emergence in new forms of drug resistance. So according to an estimate, I think less than 60% of uh, MDR TB patients who initiated uh, treatment are successfully treated. So less than 60%, uh, excuse me. Uh, and, and the reasons are either due to mortality or not adhering to the treatment programs. Either they don't take the drugs regularly or they don't take all their drugs. So adherence increases the risk of good treatment outcomes. And as this uh, particular study shows, with patients with both uh, MDR, TB, as well as HIV, um, the higher the adherence, the better outcomes for these patients. And adherence can be promoted through uh, technology such as electronic dose monitoring, but ultimately, such a, any sort of approach, technology otherwise, has to be part of a broader patient-centric approach to patient care. So as the WHO guidance states, while people have, uh, with TB have an ethical duty to adhere to and complete treatment and observe uh, ID prevention and control practices, uh, healthcare systems have also the duty to support patients' ability to adhere to treatment, uh, including and especially through uh, patient-centered focus approach. So as defined by the guidance, uh, patient-centered care approach in this context means that treatment should be accessible, acceptable, affordable, and appropriate. Patients should have choices about location of treatment when uh, patient, when directly observed uh, treatment is used, and who should be doing the observation. Um, in line with this recommendation, a lot of countries have implemented community-based directly observed uh, treatment and video observed uh, treatment. And there should also be uh, social support, and this includes not just financial, but really engaging the patient to understand their barriers to treatment, as, as well as enablers for treatment, right? and enablers for adherence. Uh, one of the benefits of patient-centered care is not just to the patient, but it also ultimately uh, benefits public health and reduces the tension between individual freedom and welfare and public health. Right, by, for example, reducing the need for a coercive approach, such as uh, confining patients against their will. So just to bring you to the context of Singapore, where treatment is heavily subsidized and medications are free, there are uh, available financial as well as psychological support to ensure that pa patients adhere to treatment. They can choose to have their treatment administered at the nearest public health facility. Uh, for some patients, such as the frail and elderly patients, uh, DOT is, is conducted in their homes. So the providers will go there to observe uh, their taking of the medication. Uh, there's also, importantly, drug susceptibility and res resistance testing, including for second-line drugs. Uh, this, of course, is aimed at improving patient health, but also uh, at surveillance. And any sort of coercive measure is, is used as a, as a last resort, as determined by a committee for what we call TB treatment defaulters. Not a nice name, but yes, that's the term we used. So, um, uh, as we all know, uh, then um, countries, according to the guidance, all countries should provide free and universal access to TB services of high quality, including this sort of testing, but not all countries are able to do it. And so, according to the guidance, the international community should provide such support, especially to resource constrained countries that cannot meet this obligation. Um, there are many reasons, ethical reasons to do this. One, of course, is humanitarian, which is simply to respond to people's suffering. In this case, patients with TB. There are justice uh, reasons um, to eradicate or ratify global health inequalities and inequity, uh, in inequities. Especially we know that uh, TB affects the poor and marginalized and treatment actually increases their burden substantially. So there's need to ratify this inequality. And lastly, for solidarity reason, in view of our shared vulnerabilities uh, to TB, as well as to as our shared interest in mitigating um, drug resistance, for example. So according to this paper, um, uh, national TB programs should, should really scale up and develop rapid diagnostic programs for detecting drug resistance, including to uh, pedacrylene. Um, but um, as, as 
can be suggested here by the guidance that all countries have the ability to do this, so there should be more support for such development. So this is my last slide. Um, on the issue of the appropriate use of betaclin to treat drug resistant, uh, resistant TB, uh, this can be analyzed at multiple levels, uh, individual patient health, public health, and global health, but they are actually rather all in interconnected. So we can't just only focus on the ethics of public health to prevent drug resistance without focusing, uh, focusing on uh, individual patient health, which is underpinned by respect for patients as persons, maximize benefits, prevent harm through the concept of patient-centeredness. And as I mentioned, uh, not all countries are able to develop and implement patient-centered care and optimal TB diagnosis and treatment. So from a global health ethical perspective, there should be a lot more solidarity support from resource-rich countries to help resource poor countries to achieve this. And although such support is advanced through initiatives such as the Global Fund for to fight AIDS, tuberculosis, and malaria, um, efforts to fight TB and drug resistance, resistant TB remains uh, very much largely under-resourced. Under Thank you. Thanks, Sean. Thank you so much indeed, and to all the other speakers for uh, very elegant summaries of the current situation. As you know, what we're going to do now is cover the first of three topics, which is what went well and what went wrong. And I think we've got both of those. I think the, the impact of Bedaquilin is striking. The concerns about it are obviously palpable too. Um, just the panel uh, and, and the, I should say, by the way, the bios of all our incredibly experienced uh, panel are available online. So that's why we aren't giving you detailed information about them all. But I'd just like to invite some of the panel who haven't so far spoken to just give some reflections on what you've heard so far. Let me kick off maybe with Derek, just because I can see you right in front of me. Me, I'm too visible on the screen, Mark. I mean, I think it's been excellent so far, hasn't it? It's been a really good discussion from both a patient and then a laboratory and then a clinical perspective. But I think we, themes are emerging, I think, from the discussion so far. And one of the themes that's emerging is the need for rapidly accessible drug susceptibility testing for new drugs like bedaclin so that we can identify this problem quickly. And so I think that's probably something that, that we have to discuss. And the slightly challenging uh, suggestion that uh, Grant made, that when you're developing a drug, we should be careful about how quickly we roll it out unless there's DST to go along with it. And I kind of agree with a lot of that. But of course, the counterpoint to that is that Aquilin has done a lot of good in the last few years. And if we held it back while we're developing DST, how many lives do we lose while we're developing the DST? So there's a benefit and a trade-off you know, there as well that perhaps we might, we might want to discuss. Francesca really offered us some really interesting suggestions about how we might tackle the issue in the clinic, um, including the, you know, the idea that we might bolster bedaquiline treatment early on while it's got limited EBA with other drugs. I had never considered doing that before, so I'm interested in what other people think of that sort of challenging idea. And I also saw in the chat there was an interesting comment from Simon Tabiri about whether we might not be giving bedaquilin for long enough to some patients, given that it's got a very long clearance tail. And if there's still viable bacteria around while the drug is diminishing, that then that might be a sort of odd pharmacokinetic property of bedaquilin that increases the vulnerability to resistance. So lots of things discussed, Mark, um, and lots of discussion points to pick up, I think. Thank you. Uh, Rob, Rob Warren, do you want to just speak a little bit about resistance and some of the, the data that were presented actually um, that you've been connected with? Thanks for the opportunity, yes. I mean, I, I fully agree with the consensus of the discussion so far that we need very early diagnostics. And at the moment, our hope is really pinned on GDST or genetic uh, mechanisms. The question is, are we sort of stumbling over that and not looking outside of the box a bit and saying, are there other alternatives? And recently the NIH, I think, put, brought out a, a call, and th that call has been funded now, for alternative mechanisms, alternative phenotypic methods, which are then not reliant on our knowledge of variants in, in the various genes associated with the resistance, but rather trying to look at 
alternative strategies that may be a lot faster. So I think tools need to be developed that go beyond what we have currently today. I would say that's going to be critical. Um, I think the other question, perhaps with the tools that we have today in terms of phenotypic drug susceptibility testing within routine care and very high throughput laboratories like we have in Cape Town, uh, one would like to know how reliable these tests are being done. For example, are we needing to do backup um, retesting to confirm resistance as we go forward? I think that's a challenge, particularly if you're processing 40 to 50,000 specimens a month. Mm. And so I think that's where we really need to be going. I do feel that there needs to be a global effort where, we, where everybody contributes data to ensure, and then with the, 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 the mutation catalog of the WHO is in some ways that is doing that, but we really need everybody to contribute data so that we can catch up uh, in terms of the numbers um, that we need to really get statistical power to understand genotype versus phenotype. So I think right. that, those are, are some serious challenges and, and, and Grant has made you know, a, a number of important points. What is the meaning of a raised MIC and how does that influence treatment outcome? I don't think we have the data yet to understand that, but it has been raised uh, by Stefan Neumann in uh, Eswatini as a possible concern, for example. So I'll stop there. Thank you, Rob. And talking of global, I want to bring in Chen Wan Chang now to just give us a perspective because one of the great things we've got speakers from all over the world. So Chen Wan. Thank you. I think I really appreciate a lot of good points being made uh, up to now. I think that I agree that it's important to have a capacity of subsidy testing to the category. Uh, we also need to understand that that would not happen very quickly. What is more important, in fact, has been highlighted earlier, is that the companion drug is important. So like, for example, for quinolone resistance really increase the risk of acquiring resistance to beta -glyph. So I think it's very important, and the tool is available to have rapid testing of quinolone to ensure that uh, we design a good regimen to be used. So uh, I also appreciate the comments made by uh, Francesca saying that the beta -glyph may not be really killing in the early one to two weeks. So we need a strategy to protect a bedacrity in early stage, especially in the first two weeks. And I also appreciate uh, Francesca mentioned that amikacin may be the drug to do the tree. Uh, I would like to share that the, the stream trial, the regimen B of stream trial, that only have six months, six months duration with two months injectable and then uh, bedacrity throughout. So now my, my colleagues discussion also the same point that perhaps we can reduce the duration of the injectable to just two weeks to protect metacrylin and then let uh, metacrylin and quinolone to do the treat. So I think that number one is that we really need to develop capacity of PST uh, to metacrylin, but, but very important is to ensure that before we get the capacity all over the world, we need to have a strategy to de design a good regimen that can protect uh, the companion drug as well as the core drug that would be beta-equity. Finally, I would like to also mention that the drugs alone may not be sufficient. We need a strategy, and that, in fact, is a package of the strategy for TB prevention and care. And that would be the default strategy and from the outset. Well, as uh, Francesca mentioned, we also need to ensure that adherence to treatment uh, would be really take place, and then patient would be uh, if they suffer from adverse reaction, they would have the someone to help them to deal with this uh, adverse reaction. I stop here. Thank you. That's that's fantastic. Thank you so much. I'm now going to ask Christoph. Um, I have multiple questions for Christoph, but one maybe um, a, a fairly straightforward one is: there's the implication all the time that the dacrin by itself leads to rapid resistance, and you need to sort of protect it. Is that implying that actually it's very easy to acquire bedacrin resistance? What do you think? That was one question. Yeah, the other ones will come. <laughs> um, I'm not a microbiologist, but uh, it seems that there is uh, emerging resistance on insufficient regimens uh, from different parts of the world now described. Uh, we did this in the Republic of Moldova, where we found 15% of um, MDR-TB strains on failing regimens that develop resistance. Now there's grant 
and others, uh, the manuscript I think is accepted somewhere for publication, but it's on a preprint server where more than 30% of resistance is shown. And um, this appears that bedaquiline is actually very vulnerable for developing drug resistance. And it may need much less bacteria than, for example, for isoniazid or for rifampicin for naturally occurring mutations happening that are conferring resistance. Now, the what, what was initially thought, this ATPE mutation, uh, which is conferring high-level resistance, that is seen all over the world very rarely. But different types of, especially RV0678 mutations, some conferring low-level resistance or some not, but not all being fully susceptible then, um, there's much less uh, knowledge about this. And we don't, the clinically relevant question is, can these mutation or the effects of these mutations be overcome by increasing bedequilin dosage? Um, that would mean therapeutic drug monitoring. And uh, this is unclear so far. Wow. So you, more and more things um, to add into it, therapeutic drug monitoring as well as DST. Imakat, so please go ahead. Yes, I'll send there's a question in the chat that I just picked up on uh, uh, that uh, uh, using uh, injectables uh, in the first uh, few months or early on on treatment does did not really improve uh, culture conversion uh, or was, uh, sorry, my apologies, was associated with higher sputum culture conversion in six months in people living with HIV uh, compared to those with HIV. Uh, without HIV in priority stage analysis, yeah. So maybe that maybe yeah, that's something to really think about. Uh, and uh, but I think uh, Dr. Conrad, you had said it's not a recommendation as yet. And maybe what are some of the concerns you have uh, uh, personally? You think it might work, but what are the concerns that you possibly uh, think of making you hold back? Besides that, there is no data. Uh, or clinical trials done yet. Thanks. So I think we've become allergic to injectable agents. We've heard two stories from people who survived TB that had terrible side effects. Pumeza lost her hearing and Oxana had terrible vestibular side effects. So it's almost with concern that I would suggest something like that. But uh, I don't think that they will be a readily available high throughput bedaquine resistance testing for our program for the next two to three years. So we've got to think of something in the meantime. And that's why I suggested this protection. And in addition, the protection of even considering older drugs like INH, if there's INH sensitivity. Um, I, I think Chen Wan also made a really good point. I think that part of the reason why the shortest course in stream was successful was because it didn't have ethionamide in it. But the other one was because it protects this rather strange EBA associated with the pedaquiline. Thank you. Can I, can I add something here? Mm -hmm. there, there's evidence in fact, if you uh, read the paper about stream stage two published on the Lancet, and you will see that in regimen C, using betaquiline without injectable, there was acquired resist resistance to betaquiline. In regimen D, that include both injectable betaquiline and also quinolone. There was no acquired resistance to betaquiline. So that's the point that I tried to make. Meaning that as Francesca mentioned, we may not have capacity of sensitivity testing to metaphorine very uh, quickly, but mm -hmm. we would really need strategy to protect metaphorine. Number two is that uh, if we can you know, use the uh, drug that has high early bacterial cell uh, activities in just a short period of time, we may be able to mitigate the risk of adversely reaction of the injectable, but at the same time, uh, benefit from the use just for a, a few days, a few weeks, and to protect uh, the doctor. Thank you. Yeah, no, thank you. I think I agree with you, especially that 
we need to protect. I think we all agree it's, um, it would be nice to look into the newer pipeline of newer drugs. And maybe that's why we're also having these discussions, but it's not always easy uh, to come with a wonder drug like betaqualine. It takes many years of research and many years of trying different molecules. It's not as quick as we wish uh, that we can have this drug for five years, then it doesn't work anymore and we we'll move on to the next one. I think Derek, you had your hand up, please go ahead. Yeah, I think other people are starting to cover it, so I'll be brief, but we've sort of focused in on this idea of bolstering bedaquiline with someone else. And then we bolstered, we've focused on the idea of it being an injectable because that's what Francesca initially said and that's because of what we're used to. I mean, two comments we be, I'd be interested to hear what some of the patient representation on the call think of the idea of going back to injectables because the main risk in doing that is taken by them and many, many people don't like it. But also secondly, as has been indicated, it doesn't need to be a step backwards to amicacin in order to bolster it. We've got new drugs now. You know, we've got protominid, linezolid's got good early bacteria cell activity. So the idea of bolstering treatment early with bedaquiline doesn't need to be a step back to a drug with high toxicity. We might be in a position where the drug landscape allows us to be more imaginative than that. Yeah, uh, uh, thank you. And Christoph? And then maybe after Christoph, we'll go back to the repertoires and see if uh, the tech has been sorted. Thanks. Yeah, I like the way the discussion is going because we, for the first time, actually are discussing sequential therapy based on risk of acquiring resistance and efficacy. So if we think what are the, the where are the targets of the, the medicines that we have, the majority is targeting cell wall uh, production. and in initially, these drugs are bactericidal. They kill and they uh, reduce the bacterial burden. And with less bacteria, there's less possibility for acquiring uh, resistance in the face of um, prevalent medicines. So if we would use actually something like a bactericidal agent that is cell wall active, in initially just to get down the burden of uh, bacteria and then go in with a drug that has a very poor um, EBA like bidaquiline that almost failed actually clinical development beyond phase 2a because of its poor EBA but which is now the best drug that we have in TB shown by the uh, truncate TB trial where it was superior to high dose rifampicin for showing that patients with drug susceptible TB for the for only two months have um, non-inferior treatment outcome to six month standard regimen. So if we would use a sequential process like that, we, we may take the advantage of the long-term killing um, with bedaquiline by reducing the effect of acquainting drug resistance when the bacterial burden is high. If we don't use the drug right from the start, but just give it a little bit later when the bacterial burden becomes less. Okay, no, thank you. Uh, Rapporteurs, yes, Oksana, uh, the TB survivor perspective. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yes, yes. There's a question actually for the TB survivor. Yeah, just some points to mention uh, as, uh, as a TB survivor and as a civil society ad advocate and a TB advocate and being engaged actually in stream two trial as a community uh, representative. Uh, actually, we've been very surprised seeing the, the results of the stream two showing a better efficacy of a, uh, injectable containing the regimen uh, comparing to one with no, no injectable. It, it was a surprise and in a shock, but actually when we are thinking deeply and uh, balancing the risks uh, of um, losing bedaquiline, I think it, for, for the research people, it's actually very important to come back maybe again to the results of stream two and see the regimen containing uh, uh, the injectable. As a, as a perspective of a patient, I think if we if we need to choose among the among the treatment regimens, first of all, it's it's actually to 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 find the best to pro protect a good drug, and if it is necessary to to find alternatives and to introduce for a couple of uh, of um, months an injectable with, with less uh, with less side effects, but in the same time ensuring uh, hearing monitoring, which, which is critical. 
and taking up very being very specific in monitoring to to depict any side effects in a timely manner and address them i think that's absolutely critical and therefore there can't be one one answer to uh, to to the to the audience using or not using injectable because it's not right we need we need to balance the arguments we need to see uh, and to construct uh, like the future for the treatment and around uh, as we know that the daculin and nasal it shows very good results and if it's necessary to to protect the development of resistance for some of the of the drugs it's necessary to be in combination uh, the, the risks and opportunities should be taken into, into consideration and explained clearly to the civil society uh, while ensuring the rights of monitoring, uh, of a hearing loss to be taken into high consideration. This is critical. Once it's balanced and the, the truth is shown with all these positive and negative aspects and uh, the, the necessity to, to build a good strategy for the future uh, as long as you don't have a lot of alternatives, I think that's very important. And this is not like using or not using injectables. This is about building a good strategy, building a good treatment regimen. Well, it's important to, to contain an injectable and there are no alternatives. We need to think deeply. We need to, to consider the efforts. We need additional resources for monitoring and more, more attention to patients while taking big, these injectables but at the same time protecting the decline drug to develop the system because this is about the future. That's my perspective. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yes, and uh, really the safety uh, always be a concern, uh, but as much as we want an efficient regimen that does what we expect it to do, uh, it must also be accessible. So while we think about all the other things that need to go with it, uh, access must always be maintained um so that we can save lives if it makes a difference i think the rapporteurs are ready but uh, mark yeah i can hand over to you Thanks. one thing i had was um obviously we've got the united nations high level meeting coming up um in september a lot of work's already gone into it i'm hearing a lot about strategy and i thought uh tech Xuan, um summarized it really well when he was talking about personal public and global so just thinking about global strategy and also cost, because that's got to be somewhere in there, because everything we're talking about is not cheap, uh, either for the individual or for, for nations. Um, what is the panel's view on that? Who, who wants to pick up on that? Firstly, what should we, is it too late for the UNHLM meeting? Uh, some of the things we're discussing, are we hoping that it's going to be in there anyway? And secondly, what about the cost of all of this? Yeah, I think that a crucial a uh, challenge here is that the bedacone is too expensive. So we really need to reduce the price of bedacone. So I'm, I'm saying from the perspective of the cost effectiveness study of a stream trial. The stream trial uh, you know, has uh, concluded cost effective, cost utility uh, uh, component that been recently published on the global, uh, Lancet Global Health. Mm. And it shows that most of the regimen, most of the bedacone containing regimen would not be cost effective in the majority of the resource limited setting, simply because bedacone is too expensive. So I think unless, uh, so maybe perhaps on the one hand, we need to get more funding to make uh, these important drugs be available to those really in need. But on the other hand, it's also important to try to reduce the cost of beta equity, so to make it cost effective for the uh, uh, countries with uh, limited resource. Thank you. Thank you. Um, who wants to, anyone want to pick up on that? Lance, one of the things I was struck by in your presentation was the remarkable data which shows that despite what we might be able to do, actually it comes down to who writes a prescription and who knows what they're doing. Um, how much how much effort should we be putting into that as well? That seems that seems crucial. That is absolutely crucial. Is what we've uh, learned over the years. Uh, the fact that we saw resistance rates which were unprecedented. Uh, a lot of us believe that a lot of it was was related to unregulated prescriptions. Uh, I was looking at Grant's presentation as well, and when he talks about uh, the bedicolin resistance being strongly related to fluoroquinolone resistance, 
Mm. That is extremely worrisome, worrisome for someone like me who comes from a country where we traditionally talk about 60 to 70 percent fluoroquinolone resistance. Um, and by the time we wait for a DST, we usually put people on empiric prescriptions, which include a fluoroquinolone sometimes. And whether that will amplify bedequilin resistance is a, is a serious cause for concern. So I, I think uh, the government, uh, to a certain extent, did right in regulating the sales of the drug. So unlike other antimicrobials freely available uh, over the counter, so traditional TB drugs can be purchased over the counter at chemists, but uh, drugs like bedequilin are, are available only through the government. So I think that was a wise move uh, to make sure that it wasn't indis indiscriminately used. At the same time, you know, we, we do have to make sure that everyone gets access and figure out public-private mixes or some sort of partnerships where even individuals approaching the private sector, even a physician who may not be well-versed with the drug, is then liaised with someone in the government who can then uh, make sure that it's used appropriately. Thank you. So there's, there's something there. And what about people um, uh, in other parts of the world outside of India, what's your experience of, of something? And is this similar? Is this a phenomenon that's being repeated? Are there positive ways of, I mean, for example, the rollout program in, in South Africa, what, what information do you have from that? There was a suggestion that we should be looking to use national uh, TB program data sets. Is that something that's going to be available and be able to drill down into it? Or is it the data just not, not robust enough? If I, yes, I was about to say, if I may answer that, the data is very robust and in fact the data from the South African National TB program informed the latest iteration of the guidelines by the WHO. At the moment, the WHO endorses BPALM for the treatment of rifampicin resistant or two different strategies, a nine month strategy without an injectable. And the one with linezolid is based almost entirely on South African data. So it is available. Of course, programmatic data is not as robust, but uh, that's counterbalanced by the fact that clinical trial data is probably too robust, meaning that so many people uh, are excluded from clinical trials. And my particular bugbear is those with substance abuse are excluded, whereas it's not an uncommon overlapping risk factor for drug-resistant TB. So in South Africa, the data is available. Well, it's not available to common use, obviously, but uh, it is used to inform policy. Even the individual patient data meta-analysis uh, that categorized the drugs, drugs was largely from national databases. So I think it's vital that it's used and it's properly collected. In terms of how Bidaquilin is rolled out in South Africa, you know what, it's rolled out. Uh, we have a program where the treatment of drug-resistant TB is deferred to nurses. And, but they may not deviate from the guidelines. So the guidelines say you prescribe this medicine, you do these blood tests, this ECG. And uh, they can't, uh, doctors can be a, a little bit, and I'm one too, can be a little bit naughty, that they think that they know better. Whereas uh, ours is a very a strict program where even nurses can perform it. And of course, when something goes wrong, for example, culture conversion doesn't occur by the third month or anemia occurs, then the nurses can refer up. But it's, it's vital that everybody does the same thing based on the evidence that we've accumulated. Thank you. So in other words, we need to make sure that, and I can see the logic in that, that you are trying to do something in a standardized way so at least you can measure it and then determine what might be wrong or hopefully not, and then alter that rather than the randomness, which is often associated with, with medical practice. Okay, so we're going to, the rapporteurs are having difficulty communicating, so we're going to use questions uh, and I'm going to feed them to the uh, panel, but Dimakatsu, go ahead. Yes, no, just uh, uh, still still on the uh, uh, antimicrobial or uh, how do we prescribe in a responsible way and thinking the data shared from India really showed that the private sector does uh, as they please in a way if you get 63 different prescriptions uh, to treat the same illness. I was just thinking what are some of the strategies that India has uh, implemented that maybe others can learn from uh, to improve uh, stewardshipness in a way on uh, uh, prescriptions or uh, my antimicrobial use uh, 
and maybe what we can learn for uh, this bedaquiline to say how can we put better controls to make sure that the right prescriptions according to the guidelines are being issued out. Thanks. That the government did was make TB a notifiable disease here, which wasn't uh, the case. And, and, and I think they made it quite stringent uh, in multiple ways to make sure that everybody reported every patient who had tuberculosis. So now uh, laboratories are, are um, kind of, it's, it's mandatory for laboratories to report patients with TB as well. And then the government has a tracking system through which individuals receive phone calls asking them whether they are on appropriate treatment, who is treating them, uh, and, and some sort of a, a check mechanism to make sure that they are being adequately treated. Uh, I think the prescription of uh, anti-tuberculous drugs by chemists has gradually been on the decline. So as opposed to uh, routine antimicrobials, I think there is a move to not allow chemists to, to sell anti-TB drugs without mention, without uh, uh, having having a, a trail of the prescription that is provided and, and making a notification of who and uh, when has prescribed a particular drug. So I think that kind of indiscriminate over-the-counter sales have decreased over the years. When it comes to bedequilin in, in, in in uh, as, a, as a specific case, um, it was just not sold in the private sector. So it's not sold, it's not accessible to the private sector, and it can only be accessed through the government in some way. So I think that's that's a that's a mechanism to keep things uh, in check as well. Uh, so I do think prescriptions today, if audited, would be better than what they were about 15 years ago. Uh, however, you know, a lot still needs to be done. We need to make sure that we protect future drugs from indiscriminate use. And, and that's where the whole debate lies. You know, you want all your patients to be able to access it. And yet you deal with the reality that about 50 to 70 percent of the population prefers the private sector as the first point of contact. And, and those are challenges that we need to overcome. Mm. Uh, big issues. OK, so taking thank you very much. Taking some uh, questions from um, from the uh, from the audience. Uh, one is about um, DST, so it, and I'll just read the question. Timely DST for bedaquilin and for key companion drugs is going to be uh, important to avoid resistance emerging. Um, gene experts probably not going to work, um, and so do we need to revisit rapid, i.e. near patient phenotypic testing, uh, such as with uh, MODS? Um, that was certainly, uh, when it was used, scalable and affordable. Uh, is this something we should be doing? So what do people think about new approaches to uh, uh, rapid DST? Uh, some quick responses, please. Grant. Yeah, uh, thanks, Mark. So, so first of all, I think genotypic DST has great rule in value, right, for known variants. So if a particular variant is there, we are increasingly confident in knowing that it is associated with resistance resistance. Um, so I just don't want us to abandon genotypic DST completely. I think it has a very focused role. Phenotypic DST, especially if it can be rapid, as I said in the chat, would be a total game changer. Um, I, I think that is still some years away, um, but should be a research priority. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any other comments? If not, just to follow on that yeah. from Grant, yeah. I mean, I think I agree with you, Grant, that we shouldn't abandon genotypic DST, but I think what we might be learning is that in a flurry of excitement about things like expert, we kind of abandoned phenotypic DST as something that's still important, and now that's slightly coming back to bite us, and we have to have a more balanced approach. Okay. Uh and uh, and then uh, just sticking with uh, with uh, bedaquiline resistance. Um, is that driven, most, most bedaquiline resistance is driven by an efflux pump. Uh, where have we got to with considering pump inhibitors? So in other words, adding in drugs such as verapamil. Do we need to consider this again? So again, something about protecting, something about using other drugs. Who should I ask? To, Rob, do you want to um, comment on that maybe? Well, I'll try. We, we once wrote a paper many years ago on mm. using um, Verapamil to restore susceptibility to rifampicin, yeah. uh, and so I, th I think, it, but it was just in the model, you know, rather than in a in a uh, in vivo situation. So I, I do feel that's an opportunity, definitely, um, to be able to design new, well, targeted pump inhibitors that would allow um, restoration of susceptibility. And perhaps prevent um, resistance from emerging. But of course, the bacteria is also very clever. 
and we have to take that into consideration. It will find a way if it's given an opportunity. Thank you. And uh, taking two questions and combining them into one, there's a lot of discussion about staging in terms of um, just determining um, where someone is within their treatment course and what might be needed at a certain time. And also we've just picked up on using potentially adjunctive or protective therapies. So um, the question is, um, do we need a big adaptive platform trial in, in drug resistant TB rather than further regimen A versus regimen B trials? Um, because that would seem to be a, an efficient way of doing things. What do people feel? Uh, who'd like to comment about that? I'm sort of tempted to ask Francesca briefly to comment. Yeah, I was tempted to raise my hand, but I thought I might be dominating. I think that this is the way to go. I think, first of all, ultimately, the World Health Organization issues guidelines in the treatment of both drug-sensitive and drug-resistant TB. So they are the ultimate users. Uh, well, they are the ones that kind of, and I'm using the wrong word, but kind of control the market. They have definitions of success and often clinical trials do not match those definitions. So there is requiring of a reanalysis. And I think that if we took candidate drugs and bung them into uh, candidate regimens and put them into a platform trial, we could abandon the stuff that didn't work a lot sooner. We wouldn't be spending as much money and we get much more rich information from it. And I think a platform trial has to be the way to go. We learned a lot from COVID and platforms was one of them. Mm, certainly. Um, chip in any of the other panelists. Yeah, go ahead. Sorry, sorry I don't want to keep coming in. Uh, uh, By all means, go ahead. ahead. Go ahead. I, mean, I guess I would just uh, agree, I think, with, with Francesca, but also I think, Tom, you to ask a question about um, platform trials. I mean, probably important to acknowledge that we are moving towards platform trials in many aspects of TV. For example, Unite for TV is doing big platform trials. Now, part of the difficulty, I think, for me is that one of the issues we've discussed here is working out what the best companion drugs are to protect the backbone from development of resistance. And setting the endpoints for them in big multi-stage, multi-arm trials is you know, a little bit difficult. And what we really are focused on there is um, primary endpoints around efficacy, but we should still try to do it. Thank you. And just picking up on, on trials and adjunctive therapies, a question has been asked, what about host-directed therapy? Um, should we be, are we actually doing it that without realising it? Um, and should we be doing it much more upfront? And if so, how should we achieve that? Again, large platform trials or, or specifically looking at certain drugs or, or ways of uh, protecting, uh, of treating TB. Christoph, do you want to, you've, you've written a lot about personalized therapy. What do you think about adjunctive therapy in this setting? Yes, thank you very much. So I think one of the um, downsides of current approaches for host-directed therapy is that they have been looking for one size fits all solutions. And if we uh, try to um, simplify the situation, like really simplify it on a one dimensional scale, we have on the one side patients who have too much immunity and on the other side, we have patients who have too little immunity. Let's, let's take those who have a lot of inflammation where there's the bacteria, uh, in the lung and uh, there is what we would call tabula rasa and the cells are sent into necrosis and apoptosis and a lot of cavities. That's too much immunity and the bacterial load may actually not be in relationship to what's going on. And on the other side, there may be the prototype of person living with HIV uh, who has a higher bacterial burden and we see this with uh, easier detection of um, urinary lamb in this situation despite less inflammation. So the one person may need more immunity of a Th type 1 um, immune response with TNF alpha and um, IL1 and IL2 and, uh, and um, interferon gamma, whereas the other person may need the opposite. So 
we can continue running these trials with one type for all solution for post-directive therapies or try to stratify by endotypes. There are a few groups who are doing this, trying to identify different endotypes based on RNA-based uh, signatures. Uh, Andrew DiNardo from Baylor College of Medicine in Houston is, I think, on the forefront. Uh, and that would be a much smarter idea. Um, so not everyone will get the same host-directed therapy, but in the terms of precision medicine, according to different types of patients, patients would get different um, like disease stage or um, endotype um, specific types of host-directed therapy. We're very far away from that um, still at this uh, point in time uh, to get this into clinical practice, but I think this would be the way forward. Okay, thank you. I think we've uh, uh, covered quite a lot uh, in the last uh, uh, hour uh, in terms of the discussions. We're supposed to compartmentalize the discussions, but I think um, it's been great uh, how it uh, sort of flowed uh, and led to one thing from another. Uh, but I think maybe it would be good to move to the next uh, segment uh, that looks at uh, where to next. Uh, we have uh, covered quite a lot and what are the main issues, who maybe uh, how do these issues interact between the different areas of uh, expertise and uh, you know, what makes Bedakwalin a success story and possibly some of the things that have gone wrong uh, in how we've been doing things uh, in terms of uh, prescribing or uh, limiting access to Bedakwalin. Uh, but yeah, I think looking at our time, uh, we have about 40 minutes left and it would be good that uh, the next 30 minutes or so we focus more on the uh, what to where to next. We have already touched a little bit on those um, and one of the questions that uh, the organizers had was, uh, should bedaquiline uh, be only for drug resistant TB or should it be for drug sensitive TB as well? Maybe we might have touched on that a little bit, but yeah, maybe Derek, do you want to share your thoughts on that? Um, I don't really want to be the one who tries makes a bad job of answering all the difficult questions, but, <laughs> <laughs> but it, 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 there is a difficult tension there, isn't there? Because clearly, you know, it is one of our, despite the worries we have, it's one of our most effective drugs and we're saving it for 5% of the patients. You know, that doesn't seem to be right. But on the other hand, um, extended rollout carries the risk of amplifying the resistance problem that we're already describing. So I think I think that's difficult. I suspect I don't particularly want to see, I don't know, but one question I might ask is, do we want to see a drug becoming used first for first-line therapy until we have DST for it? I think that would be a significant point of concern for me. Yeah. And yeah, I mean, I, I apologize for picking on you, but uh, anybody else is also welcome uh, to add uh, uh, should we be thinking about in terms of policy or, or treatment guidelines? Should we be considering bedaquiline uh, for drug sensitive TB or is it too early or are we listening what we think is a challenge about to happen or already happening in some countries or settings of resistance? Yeah, I would be happy to share my experience if I may. Uh, currently, I have a patient uh, with susceptible tuberculosis. Uh, who uh, he, she suffered from, uh, you know, fever, high fever to be pumped. Also, uh, drug induced hepatotoxicity. But then uh, we try rebuilding. That is uh, the regular practice here in Taiwan. Patient cannot tolerate pumpkin. We try rebuilding. Uh, about sixty to seventy percent of patients might be able to tolerate rebuilding, and then we can happily uh, you know, finish treatment in six months. And, Fortunately, the patient again cannot tolerate uh, refability. So now we are trying a combination of levofloxacin and betacrine to substitute for refamacin. So the, this, this is the same idea as uh, uh, Francesca mentioned that we should aim for a shorter duration of treatment, not only for XDRTB, not only for MDRTB, 
but also perhaps for patients who suffer from adverse reaction to uh, core drugs like rifampicin, like a quinolone. So I think I agree that uh, we should maximize the, uh, the capacity of the new drugs that we have and to uh, have our patients benefit from the, uh, this new, new compound. But then uh, I would like also to raise another point that uh, uh, Francesca also mentioned earlier, that is about isoniazide. Uh, you see that now currently the international recommendation kind of mix MDRTB and rifampicin resistant tuberculosis. So in patients who were infected with rifampicin uh, resistant tuberculosis, but uh, isoniazide remains susceptible, perhaps we do not really need uh, something like dinazolib or like amikacin to protect metacrylate easily because isoniazide has excellent early bacterial effect. So I think it's very important that we look for a good, uh, a more appropriate uh, strategy or approach or regimens for patients who are infected with uh, rifampicin resistant uh, isoniazide uh, susceptible uh, um, uh, strains that they, they may, I think they may be treated with a less, you know, heavy uh, 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 regimens and also has can reduce the, uh, uh, the chains of uh, adverse reaction from that regimen. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Oksana, you can go ahead. Well, well thank you so much uh, for, the, for the question. I, I would Definitely agree with Chen, but at the same time, I would more inclined to support Derek on saying that we actually have not yet solved the problems of drug resistant TB and the Dacolin being one of the most, uh, one of the best uh, drug should not be actually compromised on use of uh, the bill. Yes, we need to shorten the treatment for uh, drug uh, susceptible TB, but still. Uh, the, the questions around drug resistant TB are still uh, still much more to to address, and uh, having so uh, few few drugs, new drugs in, in addressing drug resistant TB, are we really inclined to use uh, this drug for uh, for sensitive TB? That's a question. We do understand that the, the treatment may be shortening, and uh, absolutely. Uh, people with TB, no matter are they with a drug resistant TB or sensible TB, need to have access to shorter treatment regimens, but they need to have plan B, for example, for drug resistant TB. And as long as uh, the decoline is uh, one of the fewest drugs, uh, I, I'm not really inclined to believe that we are in an optimal time to, to use decoline for sensitive TB. So that's my opinion. And, at least as we don't have a lot of other options for drug resistance, we need to be very, very careful. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, yes, um, yes, please go ahead. Um, Pumeza, I wanted just to get your perspective also on, on what you've been hearing in some of the discussion. You've clearly been very involved in, in ensuring that there's improved access and lower cost to vidaquiline. What do you think about it, its broad use? In other words, not just in, uh, drug, in, in rifampicin resistant and multidrug resistant TB, but if it were used more widely, would that be a, a good thing or a concern or somewhere in between? Um, yes, so as, as TB survivors and also another advocacy is at the TB Zim is that we wish that the treatment for TB for one can be less and also be taken on less uh, like less time is compared to nine months, two years and all of that. So yes, especially with the first line TB drugs, it would be great because it would prevent more side effects. It can prevent, like for, for instance, people actually developing resistance to, 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 to actually the drug. So I think, yes, it, it, if that's possible, yes, it can be used widely for all forms of TB so that people can, you know, be able to go on with their lives. Because as you know, TB, Usually, taking the medication for one is a struggle because there's this cocktail of drugs, too many drugs, and then there are side effects that you actually have to go through with them. But see, if, if, as I said, if it is possible, I mean, that is our wish that there should be like less drugs and also drugs, for instance, like HIV tablet, you take one tablet and then you are all with your life. But for TV, for some reason, you stop doing things, you lose 
your job, you have to stop your studies and all that because of the chance that the TV is so toxic that you have to cause your life because you should have TV, something that, that is preventable and something that is also cur curable, but yet it's still a struggle to get like a basic stuff, especially when it comes to, to, to TV drugs. So yes, I, I, it's our wish, if that's possible, I will vote on that, yes. Thank you. And uh, I'm also going to ask Tekshwan just to, to consider some of the, the, I mean, I work with non-tuberculous mycobacteria as well. And there's a lot of people who don't do TB who are very keen on using vidaquilin for uh, non-pathogenic organisms. They cause a problem, but they might cause more of a problem. How should we be tackling it from your point of view? Something like that. When my clinical colleagues say, why aren't we using vidaquilin to treat difficult NTM? Uh, thanks. So I think there's always this tension between patient desire for whatever treatment they want, uh, uh, stewardship by practitioners who actually know what should be given, and public health considerations. Um, so although patient uh, preferences, desires should be respected to the extent that it's compatible, uh, uh, they, they, I mean, they also should be, there, there are limits to, to um, promoting patient wants and preferences, and this should be bounded by public health considerations. Uh, and that will include saving precious resources like betaclin and other uh, antimicrobials to actually protect people who actually need it and could benefit from it. So there's always this tension, uh, but I think there are good ethics to stop providers uh, from a professional perspective to, to prescribe drugs that are actually not, uh, that don't really promote patient health and actually worsens public health outcomes. Thanks. Thank you. So that, so there's something then about developing an evidence base, again, similar to what we were talking about earlier, maybe Francesca was saying about a rollout program where you do it in a, you're not quite sure of the, the answer. So you do it for a bit and evaluate it and then actually are able to make a decision. So to use the example of the Daquilin and, and non-tuberculous mycobacteria, find out if it works. And then if it definitely doesn't work, that's easy. If it does work, then you have a bit, a bit more of a situation. Um, just now making it more broad, there are studies, obviously people are interested in using it as a tuberculosis preventive therapy. What do people think about that? Who wants to Grant's heads moving side to side. So Grant, do you want to comment briefly on that? Um, that makes me nervous. I, I, you know, this is, we are only beginning to understand the broader implications of having this pump going to overdrive, right? I, I think that can have a lot of implications for the metabolism um, of TB. Uh, it, it, it seems to me that that is difficult to justify, especially for, especially as because for preventative therapy, you know, we have a very efficacious short regimen. I think preventative therapy for, for MDR contacts is maybe a one use case that, that could be motivated for. Um, but I think it needs to be assessed, right? I, even though the question makes me nervous, I think the question does need to be asked and it needs data. Thank you. Yeah, Thank I think you. one of, yeah, thanks again. One of the things uh, uh, that has always been, or was a phrase used, maybe um, might not have applied in all settings that I remember was uh, with uh, any uh, and, um, microbial uh, treatment, you need to hit hard and you need to hit early. And uh, I was just thinking, how does this apply? Uh, with pedacolin and uh, especially for drug sensitive TB will it be part of the hitting hard and hitting early uh, concept? Thanks. Uh, but I see uh, Christoph, you had a hand up and you can go ahead to, and anybody else is also welcome to respond. Thanks. Well, the preventive therapy, this is actually something that uh, should be tried in the European setting. If we look at Russia, Russia has the largest um, number of patients with drug-resistant tuberculosis in the WHO region Europe by far, and approximately 50% of all the TB cases are MDR-TB in Russia, if we take the new and the retreatment cases together. 
So a regimen based on either isoniazid or any of the rifamycins uh, would not be effective like in 50%. So in such a setting, and Ukraine is a little bit less, 30% have also less patients, but still quite a number of patients for this geographic region with drug-resistant TB. So in, in such a setting, it would be interesting to see if a uh, drug like bedecolin could be used effectively on a programmatic level for uh, prevention. But I fully agree with Grant. Uh, this is not done very easily uh, without any stomach ache uh, because, uh, of course, occurring of drug resistance um, could be an issue and um, we need to find ways to use this drug very wisely. I think that we uh, there are a few uh, short and effective uh, regimen for preventive therapy that has not yet been used widely and program condition. But in many countries uh, uh, who are uh, providing technical support, uh, they mainly deal with uh, active tuberculosis, not yet really expand the capacity, expand their program for uh, treatment of TB infection. So perhaps uh, in the beginning, perhaps you know, country can begin with using something like three HP, you know, uh, for three months, uh, once weekly, isomalazide is appending. People can also try to use three HR, three months, isomalazide, with promising daily, and they can also use try to use one HP, that is daily, isomalazide with appending. So those regimen will be used for. Uh, for preventive therapy. Uh, in terms of the context of uh, MDRTB, uh, there's a very limited number of countries really doing that, except perhaps in Europe or United States and some countries with resources. So I think that perhaps not yet the right, not yet the time uh, to really push for uh, the use of adequate for preventive therapy. Perhaps we can begin with a strategy uh, for the use of uh, pedacrine to deal with active TB and but at the same time also come up with a good uh, design of the regimen to protect uh, pedacrine. That is really uh, something is needed. So for example, in terms of access to care, uh, people got access to pedacrine but they may not get access to uh, rapid testing of the companion drugs, especially for criminal. And in countries like in Pakistan, Nepal, perhaps also uh, some part of India, you have high uh, prevalence of uh, uh, resistance to uh, quinolone among uh, MDRTB. That is going to be a, a big challenge because uh, many countries has uh, many papers report that you know combined use of the group A and group B drugs without knowing quinolone resistance, you come up uh, quickly in the beta resistance. So I think that uh, perhaps. What is really crucial at this point in time is to look for good strategy to design a regimen that can really protect a bacteria. Thank you. Okay, no, thank you very much. One of the things that also came from uh, Tech Chuan's uh, presentation was uh, as healthcare workers or as the health system, we also have a responsibility uh, to support patients to be adherent to their treatment as one of the ways of protecting uh, the drug. If uh, more people can be compliant, finish treatment on time, uh, maybe we'll avoid some of these resistance issues. And I was just thinking as part of uh, some of the next steps, what are those patient factors uh, that we should be considering uh, to improve adherence? Thanks. Yeah, the, we, I was thinking about the, uh, the adherence monitoring, the, um, the Max O'Donnell paper about um, if you improve uh, adherence to a drug and what level of adherence you need. And, uh, and of course, there are some quite forgiving drugs and there's drugs which we might have thought were forgiving and really aren't. Uh, and so that, I guess, starts to argue that we should be doing maybe uh, observational work is good, but actually we could be constructing large trials where there are elements of giving a drug and then also adding in something like a behavioral intervention as well. Um, those sorts of studies, I always think it's crucial to ensure that actually we're, we're hearing from the people who will be taking the medication. And Oksana, I wanted to just ask you, uh, have people approached you and uh, the people you work with, same with uh, Fumeza, do people come and speak with you and say, look, we want to set up studies, 
we want to know how to do them or are we going the wrong way and only talking to you after they've been done? Well, actually I'm approached by some of the scientists on, uh, speaking about the, like building a good strategy on seeing the risk factors for, 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 the t for patients in treatment. Uh, yes, so I did have some discussions about the, the, this with some, with some of my colleagues. Uh, uh, but what, what is actually true is, uh, is the fact that uh, even if we build the best treatment regimens uh, for, for drug resistant or sensi sensitive TB, we will never achieve a good results unless we ensure the, sec the, the, the other part of the, of the coin, as we say, we need the social support. Because we do know that the uh, TB is a problem in, uh, in uh, high burden and, uh, and um, low income and middle income countries. And this is uh, connected in a way or another with the social problem. And Francesca said that we, when a patient come, when a patient come into a treatment, we need to deal with the chaos of his life, which is happening uh, while he is put on treatment. And it's not about the access to only about the access to drugs. That's about the access to elementary things. In some countries, it's food, it's water, it's social support, and, and sometimes it's stigma because uh, uh, patients may belong to some marginalized and vulnerable population. This is a whole complex and uh, comprehensive strategy which should be taken into consideration when we are speaking about TB. It's not just about the drug. Maybe that's our fault that we are thinking that uh, Having a good uh, a good drug we will solve the problem. It seems to be, but that's not the only, the unique the unique issue. We need we have ethical questions. We have human rights. We have social support which is lacking. And if we don't come with a strategy which uh, which address all of these steps of the uh, of the pyramid, we will not ever. And I'm sh pretty sure that we will have very good results in TB because it's a really comprehensive and social, social disease which need to be approached uh, from both perspectives, in social, medical, uh, all together in, in a timely manner. Not just drugs, not just uh, um, food, not just water, because when the, the, depending on settings, the conditions and the risk factors may differ. But the truth is one, just drugs will never solve TB problem in, in the countries. And this is why we need to, to think comprehensively. This is, well, uh, this is why we more and more speak about people-centered approach of uh, treating patients in ambulatory, in, in outpatient and not inpatient, because we may help people to solve the social problem uh, placing him in a hospital for two months, but he will definitely come back in his own setting and he will come in the same circumstances. And if we do not work in the community there where the TV is, we will never uh, settle the problem. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I think I think your points are very well made. Ch uh, Chen Juan. Yeah, thank you. I think that uh, we have to keep in mind that uh, uh, the the MTV strategy has set an important you know, target that is to uh, ensure that no patient, no tuberculosis patient and their family uh, would face uh, catastrophic costs due to TB defined by the 20% of the household income in Spain uh, related to tuberculosis. And you see that there are a couple of countries that has, has done the survey on the uh, a proportion of patients who suffer from catastrophic costs due to TB. And they always report that the uh, relatively high proportion, 30%, 40%, up to 50% about BSTB, and then among DRTB, usually up to 70, 80, or 90% of the patients, they suffer from catastrophic costs due to TB. And mainly, not, not mainly due to direct costs, it's, it's more or less related to indirect costs and income loss. So I fully agree that it's very important that we not only think about uh, access to medicine, access to care, but also we need to come up with a uh, solution. I have not yet seen that. I have not yet seen any country, any uh, program come up with a good strategy to get rid of this catastrophic uh, uh, due to this. So I think that we need that very quickly so that we can really protect uh, our patients from getting poor because of tuberculosis. Thank you. 
Yeah, the, yeah, I mean, the health economics, I think, is, is, is critical here, isn't it? As, as you were saying, the, the stream uh, trial, the, the problem with the health economic analysis was the cost of the drugs. And so, but the long-term costs in, in, for society and for the individual, someone who is left with post-TB uh, severe disease, maybe never working again. Um, so that I think you're right, the implications are, are vast and that does seem a, a really critical, a critical area to consider. Um, there's a few questions which we could summarize from the audience, which we could summarize thinking about what are the implications of bedaquiline for other drugs that maybe are either in use or coming down the line. Um, things like protominid, uh, it's not a cheap drug either. What should we be doing about that? How do we protect that? Uh, for the last five, 10 minutes, um, some quick responses. Who wants to go first? Let's ask lucky Christoph. Poor Christoph, by the way, he's got flu. It's very good of him to be on the panel because he's been unwell for a while. So thank you, Christoph. So what about protominid? What are we gonna do about the, uh, uh, Lance, how much um, predominant do you? Uh, how much use is there in in private sector in uh, in Mumbai? So we do we do not have access yet. Uh, so so even the laminate is uh, accessible only through limited channels. The the MSF runs an outreach, and through their trials, is uh, some of our patients do have access, but it's not universally accessible, and and we don't have predominant yet. So um, that's something that we're looking forward to. Um, but again, I do realize costs are probably a big limitation at present. Sorry, it's always a tension, isn't it? Tech Xuan, um, it's that huge tension between the drug company has to make money, but you don't want to make it to make too much. Um, how do we balance that? And then I'll come to Oksana. Yeah, I think it's through the, the IP system around the world, uh, which is, of course, necessary to ensure drug development and things like that. Um, but I wonder if another way would be to for countries to seriously devote a substantial amount of the resources to say the global fund, which can not just fund uh, the medications itself, but also you know research into how to better support patients in their care journey. Uh, and there are multiple diverse needs that we heard from patients with drugs uh, issues, patients with HIV. I think these are all separate issues. I think patient-centered care really means different things to, to different people. Oksana, well, I can go ahead. Oh, thank you. If speaking about predominant in, in uh, Moldova, we, what we actually managed to do is to strongly advocate and to include the procurement of predominant in, in the next, uh, uh, from the next funding cycle from the Global Fund, it will be procured and included and we will uh, uh, almost 80% of the patients, eligible patients, will uh, will uh, will be included and will be will benefit from the PALM uh, treatment regimens in the nearest future. We are expecting the first uh, acquisition already in the in in autumn. Uh, so that this is the global fund. The the um, the issue with bretomonid will be most likely the one we have a bit in because we're speaking about the patents and this is the the generate this will generate a lot of discussion and the costs and so on and if we are speaking about the applying about appliance of intellectual property rights about patents we need to understand that we need to set a global uh, global level some clear differences between the uh, goods which are actually considered essential, like essential drugs. We are speaking about the tomonid and, and uh, uh, the lamanid and the daculine. We need to have this uh, insurance that uh, um, pharmaceutical company will not exceed in their desire to, to make more money because this is essential. Uh, this, these are the essential drugs and mostly of the drugs have been financed from public money. And this is the truth. We need to, to speak about it and we need to have this clear differential difference and uh, clear like limits. What are the limits that we can use uh, and we can apply for, for newly developed drugs? Because if we will keep it ever green, as it has been said, we will risk and we will face another issue of access to, to uh, drugs, which are actual basic, basic, of a basic need. For a, for a for a patient, and this is this is some some another kind of issue, but it needs to be addressed in a timely manner. 
as well. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, Dr. Conradi. Back to you. Thanks. Uh, I think that first of all, we've got to be clear that neither delaminate nor protominate have been shown to confer the mortality benefit of bedaquinone. Uh, in the studies that were used for delaminate, it had a moderate, moderate effect on culture clearage, but really nothing impressive. And in fact, it's not registered by the FDA. And protominate is registered as a package. It's registered as a package with bedaquinone, linezolid, and moxifloxacin. So we're not comparing apples to apples here. I think that if we lose one of the nitromidazoles, it will be sad. If we lose bedaquinone, we lose one of our major uh, drugs against drug-resistant TB. Um, that being said, in South Africa, we have a clinical access program where we've used BPAL in about 260 patients. We've had no relapses thus far, and I always touch wood when I'm saying that because we're in the process of conducting the research. But um, you know, it does seem to be a successful when you pair it with good friends, bedaquinone, linezolid, and aquinolone, then it's a very powerful regimen, at least in the year 2023. Thank you. Thank you. Christoph. Yeah, a little bit unusual. I just would like to um, like make a point for the pharmaceutical industry because they are not the bad guys. They're actually the good guys. They are making the drugs. They are providing innovations uh, so that there is at least a possibility for patients to receive novel medicines where there was not yesterday. So. Uh, we are working together with uh, several pharmaceutical companies, for example, in this Unite for TB consortium and the colleagues who are sitting on the other side for the pharmaceutical companies. They're really determined to have novel products for patients who are desperately at need. Of course, there are also within com a company that uh, works for profit and it all needs to be balanced. And we see this in the European region of the WHO, where for 2022, TBNet did a survey on availability of medicines, and we saw that both in the medium income and in the high income countries of this region, less than 40% of patients with XDRTB had access to appropriate XDRTB regimens. So it's not really the pharmaceutical company who is uh, the, the bad bad guy, but something happens in between that with the negotiations of the prices and the, the buying by governments of medicines and making contracts and making it available uh, for their patients, uh, there is a problem that needs to be fixed. We did a study in Eastern Ukraine in 2014-15, where at that point in time, there was no war, but there was already a hotspot for MDRTB. And there was a clear governmental neglect on the availability of diagnostics and uh, of medicines, although these medicines were available and people were driving Bentleys and Rolls Royce in the country, but uh, the money was allocated somewhere else. So I think the, the inequalities and uh, the availabilities of um, the medicines and implementation, that's what we need to work on. And we need to work together with the pharmaceutical industry who's providing these drugs and not seeing them as those who are responsible for the high prices only. Okay, no, thank you. Uh, I see, Grant, you commented uh, in the chat. Do you maybe want to expand on that comment or why we are making the same mistakes with the other newer drugs that are coming? Sure. I, so what I mean like that is, what I mean by that is, you know, using the same study design that I spoke about where when we identify patients um, who have delayed culture positivity uh, on a nitrometazole-based regimen, yes, given with bedaquiline, we are starting to see evidence of the emergence of resistance um, to the nitrometazoles. Uh, so, so that is around the corner. Uh, I can't comment on the extent of it yet, um, but it is happening. And I think inherently there are some phylogenetic reasons why 
uh, some strains are more likely to be nitrometazole resistant. So it, it does seem to put um, that drug class at a greater risk of resistance acquisition compared to bedaquiline, uh, all else being equal. So that's just what I wanted to point out. Thank you. No, uh, thank you very much. Th and uh, yeah, thank you very much uh, to all the uh, panel members and the ones who prepared the presentations that we had earlier on. We have very few minutes left of our wonderful session and we we'll like to sort of slowly uh, bring it to an end. I know it's been fun. We can continue with the discussions, I think, for much longer as they are very interesting and we're coming up with uh, great ideas on how we can improve uh, things, how we can protect uh, bedaquiline, how we can increase access, how we can support patients to be adherent so that maybe re less resistance develops over time. And we're learning quite a lot. I think I've learned quite a lot um, uh, on bedaquiline resistance transmission and uh, other things. And uh, it's been really great. And I just want to check with each of the panel members if anybody has any closing remarks uh, just to uh, as we uh, wind down, um, you know, anything that uh, feels uh, it's left unsaid and still important that we should hear about. Yes, please go ahead, uh, Oksana. Just one thing to say, a big thank you to everyone. It's been a very good discussion. And I do think, yes, uh, such, such discussions and uh, sessions should be repeated maybe more openly when, when patients and pharma and researchers are all together and we are sharing thoughts and speaking openly about what, what are our concerns and what are actually opportunities which need to be addressed in the, in, in the future. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. And I agree. And uh, the international representation has also uh, added a wonderful perspective. So even though we had different uh, uh, sort of uh, clinician researchers, uh, TB survivors, but the fact that we also came from different uh, countries and had different experiences, I think that also added quite a big benefit. And yes, maybe the future ones, we need to consider other groups that were not included. Uh, Grant, over to you. Thank you. So I don't think there's any danger of overstating this, but the importance of integrating research on DST into the drug development process uh, cannot be stated more strongly. You know, uh, we require drugs to show data on various clinical endpoints, including toxicity and efficacy. There is no reason that I can think of as to why um, data on how resistance can be detected uh, should not also be contributed to uh, as part of those very early steps uh, in the drug approval pathway. So I wanted to emphasize that point. Thank you. Okay, no, thank you. Chiang, uh, uh, over to you. Uh, thank you. I would just like to appreciate this opportunity uh, to participate in this event, but also hope that there will be a summary of this uh, meeting uh, discussions that can, number one, help, you know, increase access to the DACRIN, number two, also to help develop strategy globally, locally, to protect the DACRIN. Thank you. Yeah, no, thank you. Yes, uh, there thank will you. be a summary, and I think uh, the, uh, the whole session has been recorded. Uh, so the link uh, to the online uh, platform where the session can be accessed also be shared with uh, all those that registered and of course all the uh, panel members. Um, maybe uh, just before I uh, sign off and hand over uh, to Mark, just to say, I think uh, for me, uh, I got out from these discussions about seven points. Uh, it's not comprehensive. It's things that uh, just uh, maybe resonated a lot with me. Uh, one of them, as Chiang has also highlighted, is that we need to make sure that access is, uh, you know, is maintained. People can, those who need the treatment can access it maybe in a more equitable way where possible um, and also reducing then the patient uh, factors that uh, might uh, prevent them uh, from accessing all those barriers, whether psychosocial uh, uh, issues 
Uh, number two is that we need to rapid drug sustainability testing as we roll out new regimens. It's something that should be considered as part of policy, as part of program implementation to say as soon as we introduce this drug, how will we then be testing for resistance in a rapid way? Uh, but at the same time, oh, even though we have that desire, it should not uh, be limiting us uh, to start the rollout as, as soon as we start a rollout of a new drug, a wonder drug like Betaquilin, we start saving uh, lives immediately. Uh, number three is that if we have a good drug like Betaquilin, we need to protect it uh, with good adherence, maybe with other drugs uh, early on uh, in the treatment, maybe hit hard, hit early. Uh, number four, we need to be offering a lot of adherence support for patients. Maybe we need to start considering about the one tablet formulations, takes time, but maybe those are some of the things we need uh, to support patients to be adherence. Uh, and I think I like the reminder that as healthcare workers, as healthcare providers, we also have a responsibility to, to support patients uh, to be adherent to treatment. Uh, number six was um, uh, maybe the six months with pedacolin is not enough. Maybe we should be considering a longer period. And lastly, uh, we need a global uh, catalog of mutations. We need to be coming together as researchers, as implementers, to then have a better sense of where are we going with pedacolin? How can we prevent resistance? So I think it's been a really great session and I appreciate uh, everybody's participations and uh, from the panelists and all the attendees and the wonderful questions in the chats. And uh, over to you, Mark. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dimakad. So that, that, it's been a pleasure to be a co-chair with you. It's been fantastic to have such great panelists and speakers from all over the world in all different time zones. And we had a, maximally over 150 people involved uh, in the session. I just want to thank the organizers. So that's Al Leslie, Connor Tweed, uh, Helgad Klaassen, uh, Hannah Keel, Emily Shaw, here they are, yay, and of course Neil Stoker and Jess. I'm sorry to the rapporteurs that we didn't get to hear your dulcet tones. And I also want to thank Willem Hanekom, who gets driven mad by me on a regular basis as head of ARI, uh, with us coming up with ideas, and I think this was one that's just worked brilliantly. So thank you to you all, and uh, yeah, we need to make sure there's access for this, as you say, because this is too important just forget about. Have a brilliant afternoon, morning, evening, and it's really, as always, great to see you and engage with you. Thank you.